Well, hello, folks. Angela Collins. I'm the new executive director of the Vertical Flight Society. I can still say new because it hasn't been quite a, a year, a full year. So eight months in, um, Mike uh, presented a, a version of the slide last year, but I added some detail um, just to familiarize yourselves with, with me. Um, Angela Collins started officially in June right after Forum 79. Um, I have a bachelor's of science in aerospace engineering and I studied at Virginia Tech and got my master's in learning how to manage engineers. So that was a, an enjoyable experience. Um, 15 years of experience in aerospace, a few different companies listed there. Most of my career was at DARPA um, and I'm still connected with those folks. We still have regular meetings with uh, more in particular tactical technology office, TTO, um, a few programs there that we're tracking and excited about on the VTOL domain. Listed below are a few of the different programs I supported. Some of them are still actively um, being, being pursued by the DOD. And if you have any questions, even historical questions about those listed below, let me know, as I still love to talk about that stuff. Um, and some, some of my favorite photos from my first 15 years, um, the next 15 will be mostly at VFS, right? Um, so you did see that HAI. Uh, I know, I'm not, I'm not, the, so I feel like sometimes folks get, not to say they get HAI and VFS confused, or what's the Venn diagram look like? Um, what does HAI do uh, differently? I, the, this is how I see VFS. And sometimes folks ask and they get confused or, or they're just, they just don't know and that's fine. Um, these, are, these are the main pillars as I see it and now in the role for eight months um, in what the Vertical Flight Society does and what we do well. Um, of course, we publish. We provide an opportunity and a venue for, for folks in this domain. Uh, engineers, scientists, professionals to publish, and specifically primarily at the forum, but we have other technical meetings, um, opportunities to publish. Um, we're a place to stay informed. Of course, we have Vertiflight Magazine, which Mike does a great job with, and our, all of our writers, and Ian Frayne, who's sitting there. Um, EVTOL.news, which is, uh, I mean, EVTOL.news gets a lot of hits. If you type in an EVTOL aircraft, an AAM aircraft, it's usually the second link that shows up in a Google search. Usually maybe the company, like Joby, Joby.Aero, and then it's the EVTOL.news hit. And so we're excited about that. We want to see that website grow. Um, I have ideas there, but we do want to take advantage of that. Um, we educate, of course, we educate students. We also educate our members and engineers um, on more technical disciplines. We are a venue to network, of course, through our local chapters. We have student chapters. Um, we have uh, online online listservs that also serve in that serve in that role. We advocate, of course. Uh, one of my favorites, the Vertical Lift Research Centers of Excellence, the schools, um, and we do advocate for them. Future Vertical Lift, of course, we have our history of helping ensure funding was um, flowing to the Army to ensure that 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 um, was successful. Obviously, we give out awards. It is the one place to get an award if you're an engineer and you're, study, and you're studying or working in this, in this domain. And uh, scholarships, of course, and I'll speak to an update on that uh, soon. One thing I want to just let folks know, especially if they're interested and they're members in good standing, we have elections coming up. These are the five regions. They, you serve a two-year term. So these are the five regions of our board of directors that will be up for uh, elections. Um, that process will culminate in, uh, I guess, uh, elections wrap up in April, I think, Mike. So we're looking for nominations now, and we've reached out to the incumbents. We're also going to see a rotation on the executive committee. Uh, Tomas Krasinski will be graduating um, and just becoming a member. Maybe he'll join the board. And we will uh, have a new secretary treasurer come in for KJ, who will be rotating into the president position. And so those are some updates on the board front. Um, something I'm excited about, Bell has volunteered to uh, sponsor the students this year at the Forum, Forum 80. So we'll have our usual 100 student volunteers, but we're also going to have a little over 50 students uh, from the local universities there in Montreal. Forum 80, of course, is in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I'm really excited about that. It's an opportunity for many of these kids, maybe that weren't familiar with the Vertical Flight Society or that familiar with vertical flight in general, it'll be an opportunity for them to learn more about the domain that we, we love and uh, some 
of the logos of the schools that are on our short list. And we're in the process now. We have a chapter in Montreal that is working to, with the schools to identify students that are interested. Um, something else we're excited about unveiling at the forum is uh, the student council. So we have student chapters, but what, what better than to have a collective of the chapters and, and on a student council. The text is a little small, but there'll be different director positions uh, and they'll have different roles and responsibilities. We're excited about this. It has a lot of potential. You know, we're not gonna solve the world's problems, but we do see a lot of potential in having students and giving them and empowering them and giving them roles and, and opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, we'll of course have that staff from the, that we have our technical council and their student reps on the technical council and there'll be participation from the technical council as well. So we're drafting bylaws and a charter or constitution for that now. Penn State is on the hook for that. They're working on it. We've been working closely with Texas A&M as well on this and the University of Maryland. And then I'll be at the campus at UC Irvine um, with the engineering students. We have a chapter there tomorrow to, just to talk to them about this and get some more ideas from them. Uh, the Vertical Flight Foundation and our scholarship program, again, tying in the students, it's a stuff, uh, topic I like to talk about. Um, one, one exciting announcement that we are able to make is the increase in our um, award uh, amount from $100,000 in 2023. We'll be giving out $120,000 in scholarships uh, this year. We also received a record number of applicants in that. So not only are we seeing, as you can see on the right chart here, um, a 60% year over year increase in contributions to the, to the scholarship, which we're really excited about. I wanna foot stomp the fact that most of these contributions come from individuals uh, engineers and members, uh, many of which um, are, are providing funds from, uh, from their own personal accounts. And, and we'd love to see that. We'd love to see more contributions from companies. Uh, and we are starting to see some more contributions from our chapters through various events. I give some examples there. They might host a fundraiser, a golf, a golf tournament. But uh, one, one thing we can announce today at, at the Heli Expo is the increase in scholarship amount. Another announcement we can make is a membership agreement between the American Helicopter Museum and Education Center. It's in, uh, outside of Philadelphia uh, in Westchester County. So we have a uh, reciprocal uh, membership agreement where if you are a member of the museum, you get a discount at, for your membership to the Vertical Flight Society and vice versa. Um, you know, what we, they are a strong partner in our endeavors to promote vertical flight. And if you ever get a chance to visit the museum, and if you're in the Philadelphia area, please do so. And if you are a member of the Vertical Flight Society, you can let them know and you can get a discount for an annual membership. One of the other, uh, I think this is my foot stomper, yeah. So one of the other things I'm proud of in my first eight months was our attendance at European Rotors, we had a technical session on the third day. Of course, HAI helped produce that with Europe, the EHA. And a historic photo on the right side, we had the best paper recipient from Forum 79 um, present right before the best paper recipient from, from the uh, European Rotorcraft Forum 49 and together in the same room, presenting right after each other. And so I was excited to be able to share that moment on the stage uh, afterwards and then give the award to the Forum 79 Best Paper recipient. That's Philip from DLR. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Mike now. Those are some quick updates. All right, well, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things. Uh, first, uh, just to maybe draw some contrasts with um, with HAI and some of the things that you'll that you're used to here with um, with Heli Expo. So VFS has a unique view uh, because our members work across the entire vertical flight world. That's civil, military, eVTOL, research, and even space. If you look at the Mars helicopter, the next Mars helicopter, uh, the um, Dragonfly for Titan's moon, uh, for um, Saturn's moon Titan, you know, their work, the work of our members, so people, professionals, engineers, scientists, innovators in industry, academia, and government, their work today are tomorrow's products. Um, we had the first eVTOL symposium in 2014, 
Uh, we had our 11th one uh, last uh, this month, a few weeks ago in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so, you know, we've been talking about eVTOL, which is now AAM for a long time, and now it's here, and you'll see that on the, on the floor, and you see that, uh, you know, from all the press releases that, uh, that the companies uh, produce. And it's not just, you know, battery electric uh, and liquid fuel powered uh, rotorcraft, uh, but hydrogen and hybrid electric are also part of the mix. The companies are developing their aircraft. Uh, I came up with, uh, you know, the Hirschberg rule of thumb was it took, uh, you know, a billion dollars, you know, one decade and 1,000 engineers to develop a, a, a bring an aircraft to certification. That's, you know, it's a rule of thumb, so it's not very accurate, but kind of in general. And, you know, eVTOL, like companies like Jovi have been going now for 15 years. And it's not just a billion dollars, it's more than that in some cases. Uh, so it's a long haul. Uh, they've got a lot brought on, a lot of expertise at different companies that are the kind of the leading eVTOL companies. Um, and the regulators around the world are now starting, you know, are, are finalizing their, uh, their developments. But, you know, certification is not the end, end goal, right? So entry into service is always a new challenge and, and needs to prove out the business models because in the end of the, in the day, it's, these are really cool aircraft, but, you know, if you can't make money with them, then, uh, you know, they're not very useful. Um, obviously, a lot of developments in, in civil uh, rotorcraft. I'm not going to talk about that. I'll talk a little bit about the military side, um, a little bit about eVTOL. Um, so the military rotorcraft story is really changing. You know, two years ago on Saturday, Russia invaded Ukraine, and it's not a helicopter war. I mean, the Russians have lost so many helicopters because of, of bad tactics and just, you know, they're, they, they're idiots. Uh, but it's, it's a VTOL war with the de deployment of lots of drones. And so you see this, you know, it's, it's triggered this rearmament across Europe and, you know, now rising tensions in the Middle East, raising concerns about a regional war, you know, plus lots of insurgencies and such. And the military side on, on U.S. military, um, you know, as you see for this slide, and I've, I've presented this probably every year for five or six years, right? So there's the aging fleet, trying to modernize uh, with, with new aircraft. But a lot of these aircraft are the same models that were developed for Vietnam. Some of them actually, some of the same air, airframes even still flying. Uh, at our annual forum in the 2000s, you know, 2005, 2006 timeframe, uh, leadership from Boeing and, and uh, the chair of the board at the time of the Vertical Flight Society, uh, you know, brought up, you know, hey, we're just like making new Apaches and we're making new Chinooks and Blackhawks forever. We ought to be taking advantage of the technology that's available and develop something new. So with the, our support of our members uh, and others, you know, we worked with Congress who directed the Pentagon to start the future vertical lift program. And it was this master plan that was approved by the Secretary of Defense and we had different, different meetings and such to, to kick that off. And eventually they came up with like five different capability sets. So if something from, and there was actually six, there was the unmanned or uncrewed platforms at the kind of low end. And then, you know, based on size, capability set one was light, set, uh, uh, cape set two was uh, medium, then medium head of heavy. Uh, and there was a joint multi-role uh, technology demonstration program to demonstrate these aircraft, okay? so. JMR built two demonstrators. Um, one, uh, it ended up being uh, Bell V280 Valor and the Sikorsky Boeing uh, Defiant. And the government didn't have much money, so the government, the industry put in about four times as much as uh, government, um, about a billion dollars just in JMR. Now, kind of fast forward today, this is kind of unraveled. Uh, I'll, min I'll mention in a minute. Uh, so on February 8th, a couple weeks ago, the Army canceled the future advance, uh, sorry, future attack reconnaissance aircraft. Um, the Army still is looking at Cape Set 2 to replace their Seahawks and Fire Scouts. On the heavy side, the, the future long-range assault aircraft to replace the, uh, the Blackhawks has been, uh, as, is in development, so that will go into production and be fielded. Uh, the Marines is looking to replace uh, their H1s for attack and utility. 
they had Flora, Fara, and Ara, but they, you know, now they don't have Fara, they, they changed Ara to future vertical left family of systems. So you, you can see on the right-hand side, this was the Sikorsky Boeing concept. Originally, it was going to be both a transport and an attack helicopter, so replacing both the uh, Apache and the Black Hawk. Uh, you can see the big, big honk and demonstrator there. Uh, so the, the award went to the Bell. Uh, so it was December of 2022, finally moved forward in, I think, March of 2023. Um, so this is, uh, on, this is uh, moving forward uh, with IOC um, initial operating capability in about the 2030 timeframe or so. This is the, the Sikorsky design. So Sikorsky has this, uh, this X2 configuration, they call it. So these very rigid, closely coupled uh, advancing blade concept rotors coupled with a uh, pusher propeller. Um, so that combination is is much faster than a conventional helicopter. And that's what Sigursky proposed for their FARA design. You can see the two top, top uh, graphics. So that's the operational concept. That's what they were planning to put into production. Uh, the bottom is where they were basically almost two years ago. So Bell already had theirs painted. They called it 95% complete. Uh, Sigorsky got theirs painted and, and nice pretty pictures, 95% complete, complete in early 2023. Um, and they've been kind of sitting around for the last year, year and a half, whatever, waiting for the engine. The, the government decided that they wanted to have a um, uh, Specified the, the the engine the the T uh, the GE T901, which wasn't was still in development, and it wasn't even just when they started Flora, sorry Fara, uh, it wasn't even the contractor for the engine wasn't even picked yet. So they had this in developed engine. They told the contractors they had to use this engine, even though it should have been compatible with the Black Hawk and and uh, an Apache engine. Um, so the contractors did an amazing job. Bell and Sikorsky in delivering the competitive prototypes. The, I guess, as I said, it was, it's been canceled now. And part of the reason is for the operational concept. Originally, the prototypes were like, give us your best shot. We need this in a hurry because, you know, we're concerned about all the enemy air defenses. So we really want to get um, these fielded as fast as possible. We want to get it fielded within 10 years. So that was 2018. They need to be fielded by 2028 to, to deal with all these, these threats. But they didn't hold the contractors to the requirements. They said, well, of course, it's got to have this, and we need two seats, and it's got to have this, and it's got to have you know, mission equipment package and, and aircraft viability equipment, and it's got to go this far. And, it's, and so unfortunately, the operational designs, the, the prototypes were targeted for 14,000 pounds and 40-foot motor diameter. But the operational concepts, the Army kept saying, well, we need more and more and more. And so it, it basically busted out beyond what was considered to be a, a small helicopter. It was supposed to be a complement to the big, heavy Apache, and it was basically getting as big as an Apache. So that hasn't been announced or anything, but that's kind of the, the backstory as to what happened with, with that program. So, you know, we represent the people that are doing the development for the, the technology, the, the new aircraft. Um, there were designs that Sikorsky had for high-speed um, civil helicopters, uh, compound civil helicopters. Uh, they, so this is a Raider X. They called the commercial one the Corporate Raider. Pretty funny, huh? Um, but anyway, so this, is, uh, this is, have, has an impact now on, um, uh, on, on industry, right? So this was the development uh, process. The Army took the money that they were going to spend on that, and they say, well, we'll buy more Apaches, we'll buy, or sorry, more Blackhawks, we'll buy more Chinooks. Uh, so that'll help keep the companies healthy from the production perspective, but we're really losing that uh, design capability, and design teams need design funding, got design contracts to, to continue to be successful. Um, I've shown this chart for many years, but I squeeze, squeezed screws in the, uh, the Raider X there. Uh, kind of showing you where that evolved um, compared to the, the tilt rotors on the other side. Um, and so after 20 years, uh, so you see the first X2 uh, demonstrator flew in, uh, in 2008. It, it, was, it was kicked off in 2004. So 20 years they've been developing it. So they've put in a billion dollars uh, of development funds into it. 
and it's all canceled. Now, maybe there's something else that'll come out with that capability, uh, but all the plan development programs that people have been working on now for two decades is, have now ended. Uh, there are other uh, cutting edge technologies that Sikorsky is now doing. You'll see some of that, I think, tomorrow in the press briefing and on the floor, so very exciting. Uh, opportunities, but you know, there's been a lot of time, money, energy, blood, sweat, tears, uh, brain cells that have been used up in this uh, development that's unfortunately been largely lost now. Uh, just a quick, quickly to go through a few other developments. You're probably all familiar. You know, Bell uh, Bell sold the the civil tilt rotor to Leonardo, so the 609 is uh, is maturing and developing and will be certified one day, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, they've also, they're also funded for the uh, next, genera next generation civil tilt rotor under clean sky or clean aviation now. I I've showed this chart for many years, uh, but this shows that they, for the demonstrator, they'll use the AW609 uh, and, con and they are converting it uh, for a demonstrator aircraft just to, to show some of these different technologies. So it's mainly it's a butterfly tail, or sorry, a V tail, uh, it's a non-tilting engine, so more like the the Bell V280 Valor. Uh, so the engines don't tilt, just the just the, um, the rotor systems. And you can see uh, this is a picture from uh, I think several weeks ago uh, of their um, next generation civil tilt rotor that's being modified from a six six oh nine. Uh, similarly, uh, again, it says Clean Sky 2, now it's uh, called Clean Aviation. This was uh, the vision. This is where the, what I showed a year ago. So this is uh, the racer a year ago. It doesn't look that much different now. This is a, a picture from a couple of weeks ago from, uh, from uh, Oliver Johnson from Vertical. I, was, I guess I did a media tour and other people had, had this one. But it doesn't look that much different. They painted it, but the guts, right, they stuck a lot of guts in there. Uh, so it's it's much more advanced than it was in the previous picture. Um, so similar to future vertical lift is the the NATO next generation rotorcraft capabilities project. Uh, so this is replacing all of the uh, basically the medium helicopters, the Pumas, uh, the um, the the MI I don't know MI eights I guess 17s. Thank you. Uh, the export version, right? Um, so this has also been going on for more than a decade. We've been very involved with this, uh, hosting meetings for the NATO um, teams, the, the armies, uh, the U.S. Army has been very uh, heavily involved with this. At our annual forum that Angela mentioned, we'll have a whole session uh, from uh, speakers from from the uh, uh, from Europe. Uh, and the UK uh, will be speaking on this. And even though the US is not a, uh, a signator to, um, to the program, the US has been heavily involved uh, in it uh, really from day one. Um, the key challenge here at the bottom is that it's gotta be uh, deployable on a frigate or a destroyer, so it's gotta be small. Um, and that's really one of the things, if you looked at the, the V280 and the, um, the, S, the SB1, you know, the, the, the Flora competitors, one was really wide, one was really tall, right? Those don't fit into um, small ships. Um, so being able to develop aircraft, advanced aircraft that could go, you know, 180, 220 knots, 900 nautical miles unrefueled range. I mean, all these things. I mean, that's a big aircraft, and trying to squeeze it into a, a small ship is is difficult. So that's the engineering challenge there, or the development ch challenge to make all that happen. Uh, and as mentioned, we'll have a, um, a whole session on that. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the forum, as as Angela mentioned, this will be in Montreal uh, in May. Um, so we have about 1,200 uh, attendees usually. So that's you know the eng engineers, scientists, and leaders, industry, academic, government. Uh, we do have a um, uh, some a CEO panel, uh, but the heart of it is really, and we have exhibits as well. But the heart of it is really our, our technical papers. Uh, so we have uh, we've accepted over 300 um, technical papers for a presentation. Uh, so that'll be in like 10 parallel sessions on everything from aerodynamics to uh, unmanned systems. 
Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And we have an EV toll short course and a, and a tour of, uh, of Bell uh, Canada there as well. Um, just on the right hand side, so this is in 2018. So this is Jay Carter. He's the um, inventor of the slowed rotor compound um, uh, technology that Jaunt bought. And it, it was not quite this exact second, uh, but the, the guy who came up with the money to, to create Jaunt, uh, Caden Stanzione, like, like, you know, flew out to our meeting just to meet with, with, with Jay and, and decided to, um, to invest in the company. And that's why we have Jaunt Air Mobility today. Um, so, you know, we, VFS support these developments of, of technology, and we've had a lot of impact on advancing vertical flight over the you know the past 80 years of our existence. Just talk shortly, just real quickly here about eVTOL. I didn't say much, uh, but um, you know there's a huge diversity of uh, configurations types, uh, everything from wingless uh, uh, multicopters to vectored thrust and vectored jets. Um, everything, you know, like motorcycles, campers, Mack trucks, you know, sedans, they all have different roles in life. And it's the same thing with, with aircraft. So you can make something that's, you know, cheap and, and small and, and low performance or exquisite and uh, more expensive and more capable and all kinds of different applications and designs in between. So just, you know, as you see all these uh, crazy designs, um, that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we're very pleased to support uh, HAI in its advanced, uh, in its un, um, helping people understand the advancements in vertical flight, uh, so advanced air mobility. There are three sessions. Uh, this one here tomorrow that I'm moderating starts at 1.15. I'm not sure why. The other ones, the other two on Wednesday and Thursday start at 1. So you can come at 1 and, and, you know, like just say, just remember 1 each day, okay, and you can... You can see some uh, leaders from the industry talk about their their concepts. I'm doing the OEM session, uh, but also ones on operations the other days. And, and you guys know this. We have all these online resources that are available for you to take advantage of. Um, we have, as Angelo mentioned, the EV, uh, evtal.news site. So this is a directory. And we didn't mean it to be this big. It was. It started with like I think 18 aircraft. It was. It was Ken Swartz's idea, so blame him. But uh, yeah, I mean it's it's incredible trying to capture uh, everything that comes out. So if you say, well, what was the VC 007? Oh, here it is. You know, um, you can you can track that down. And so we're getting close to a thousand aircraft. If, uh, if anyone it. has ideas of how to monetize evtel.news, <laughs> uh, let us know. <laughs> now that we're putting a lot of money into it, but we have a lot of potential. So we, we do track everything from the silly to the serious, and you know most of them are on the silly side. But um, you know, <laughs> we we want people to that have crazy ideas to come to us and learn, and you can take some of those crazy ideas and make something pretty serious out of it. Um, so it's it's all education and understanding to to to, to reach that 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 uh, that goal. I did mention hydrogen at the beginning. Uh, so hydrogen is the next big thing. Um, at our first conference, our workshop in 2014, which Angelo was uh, one of the chairs for that, there was this crazy guy talking about hydrogen. And we're like, no, hydrogen's like 10 years away. So here it is 10 years later, and it's, you know, it's, it's getting here close. Number of aircraft now are flying on hydrogen. Hydrogen is a freaking game changer for vertical flight because of the energy de density compared to batteries. It is, uh, it'll be great for horizontal takeoff and landing aircraft, less emissions, uh, you know, all kinds of great benefits, but it's, it's, it's a game changer for vertical flight. Uh, so anyway, those are just a few things I wanted to bring up uh, for discussion. Happy to answer um, questions about things. And one of the key points is, you know, we're a resource. Um, when you're wondering about, you know, fly-by-wire or aircraft design or some crazy design or idea or something like, you know, like Angelo and I probably answer media requests like, you know, like once a week or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a resource. We're, the, we're a nonprofit educational technical society. We want to educate the world on the technical aspects of vertical flight. And so... Very happy to answer questions about anything that I discussed here or anything else that's off the wall and you think you can stump us with. So, thank you. Mike, Angelo, thanks very much. Um, it strikes me that the US helicopter industry seems to lose its way the moment a big helicopter program comes along. Sikorsky, 
what's happened to its commercial business. Bell gets B280 and suddenly seems to forget all its commercial business. Why do American companies do this and then seem to forget their commercial business? This is a commercial show after all, and yet none of them are really, apart from MD, Enstrom, Robinson, they're the only ones really talking about their commercial business. Let me answer that a couple of different ways. I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, Airbus is, you know, talks about how they've got 52% or more than 50% of the U.S. parapub or the, uh, I think it's a global parapublic uh, market. If it's more than six seats and it's tw turbines and stuff like that, but anyway, they, they have a big segment of that. Um, and I think they've, you know, they've invested a lot. They've got invested a lot of money in technology, and, and there's, they've found a lot of synergies and, and things like that to be able to field good products. They've got great products, and they're able to, feel, able to field them at, at, um, at affordable prices. Um, the, the, the military funding is very lucrative. Um, I mean, 6,000 Blackhawks, right? I mean, and there's many thousands more to come after that. Uh, so the, the military business is, is very lucrative. Bell, you know, invested a lot of money in the 525, 11 years ago, they, I think it was, uh, 2013, they invented it, they uh, unveiled it here. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic product. I think it'll, uh, I heard, I read something in one of your guys' uh, articles that will be uh, hopefully cer certified this year. Um, it was a, uh, well, it was a product ahead of its time because the, the offshore oil market peaked um, when it was still in development and there hasn't been the, the need quite uh, for it the last several years. And uh, the FAA basically was not ready for a fly-by-wire helicopter. And even with the 609, you kept having to teach successive generations what fly-by-wire was. And, and fly-by-wire is your friend. It's, it's great for safety um, and performance. So. Maybe not a very exact answer, but I think that uh, you know they 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 develop very sophisticated and, and excellent military products. Uh, they do have good and I'll say great uh, civil products. Uh, but yeah, they're um, you know between uh, you know obviously with, with with Robinson at the lower end, Airbus and Leonardo have fantastic products that they've developed, and and I mean Leonardo. I guess 20 years ago was almost a nobody, uh, and they partnered with Bell on the the 139. Well, Bell partnered with them, I should say, on the 139, and it is an, an excellent product that they've had tremendous success scaling up. Uh, I guess scaling up and down to the 189, the 169, 149, et cetera, et cetera. But so it's um, it's it's an interesting. Um, I guess it's, it's an interesting uh, question, and that's the best I can do to answer it, but uh, it's, um, it's something to ponder. Maybe I can give a more quick, direct answer. I, I, I'd say it goes back to manpower, and I was on the flight here watching the, the BlackBerry movie, and there's a period in the movie they're like, we need to find subject matter experts to help reduce the data packet, the bandwidth over the network uh, for the phone, because we only, can only have 500,000 Blackberries on each of these, these cell phone markets. And uh, what they decided to do is effectively poach from every other company like Google. And um, I, I see parallels and maybe, maybe some of the poaching, unfortunately. But uh, there are only so many subject matter experts in this space, smart engineers in the vertical flight community. I mean, we help fund the universities to pump out kids with PhDs. And if you are focused on a program or two, you know, how quickly can you grow as a company and start start up other helicopter endeavors. Um, I mean, we're helping folks hire, we're helping Piasecki right now, now staff up and hire, and he's struggling. Uh, they just opened, they just took over the Sikorsky Coatesville facility in, in Pennsylvania, and they're trying to hire engineers, and they can't find them. And there's only so many that are studying this stuff. And so, yeah, great, you won that Army contract, now you're gonna take a lot of those engineers and hope that 80% retention, 80% of those engineers that worked on that V280 Valor stay and not leave, because they need them. And so, you know, do you have folks, smart people that could, you know, do civil? Maybe, maybe not. So that's a different answer, but related. Also, also a good answer. Yeah. I was gonna follow up. Maybe, should the US military then embrace more of a dual use aircraft approach rather than just constantly buying military only machines? So, European 
they have bought several European dual-use... Well, not aircraft. necessarily European ones, but saying dual-use platforms, so... So, um, yeah, so specifically uh, the, the, the Army trainer, uh, sorry, the Army, um, the Lakota, right, the utility helicopter, and then now the, uh, the, the Navy trainer, right, from Leonardo. Uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Kiowa, you know, was the same as the, was the genesis of anything for what, the 206, right? Um, so they had kind of, and, and they had the trainer, the 206 trainer, and uh, the jet, was it Jet Ranger? Jet trainer? Anyway, so there has, there has been that in the case. Uh, and you look at the attack helicopter. So they had this exquisite, you know, well, first they had, you know, in Vietnam, they had the, 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 the Cobra. They replaced that with the Apache, but they needed a scout, so they were going to replace the Kiowa. They made the Kiowa Warrior, which was an interim for the Comanche. They worked on Comanche for a decade and $9 billion, and they canceled it. And then they had the off-the-shelf, you know, they, they had the Bell uh, Arapaho armed reconnaissance helicopter. It's just off the shelf. But yeah, you need to move this, you need to put more strength here, so you can have the weapons pile on, you, need to, uh, you can't use that sensor, you gotta use this sensor instead, and it, it totally ruined it. And it's not that different from what happened with FARA, where you start with something, hey, we want this, but then the army in this case kept adding, well, of course it's gotta have this, and no, you gotta do that, and it, it caused all these problems. Same thing with using the, the Merlin, the AW-101 uh, AW for the presidential helicopter. Hey, this is great, we're gonna buy this off-the-shelf helicopter. Well, wait a minute, how did, we're gonna put the President of the United States in there, so how did you certify this thing? We need to have all this, re, you know, all this re-engineering to, to make sure it's, it's certified and it costs kept going up. The, um, in the, you know, after Comanche and after ARH, there was the armed aerial scout. Well, we're just gonna buy an aircraft off the shelf and put weapons on it, but of course it's gotta do this and it's gotta do that, and oh, it's not gonna have the performance you want. So anyway, I guess the point is um, the Army in this case and, and, the, and the Air Force as well and the Navy have had these problems before where if you buy off the shelf, like that means off the shelf and you gotta be content, you gotta be happy with what that capability is and if it's not suitable, it's not off the shelf anymore. Any other questions? And we're happy to answer questions here now, any, anywhere, anytime. AAM. Cool. Any last questions? Any, any closing comments, Angela? No, thanks for joining us. And we're quite available if you want to reach out, Mike and I. Thanks for your time and looking forward to the rest of the uh, expo.